Good morning. Sorry that I am late. I, I was looking up something. It just got really interesting to me, and then I lost track uh, of time. Okay, so we're in the book of Genesis, chapter 49. My name is Doug Griffin. It's March 20th, 2022. This is part six of looking through Genesis. Uh, Jacob is giving the blessings to his kids. I'm doing three kids today. Um, Judah, Joseph, and Benjamin, because their destinies are all linked together. So um, I'm going to go over the how he blessed Judah, then Joseph, then Benjamin. It's very interesting. And then just kind of go through their history, how they're all intertwined. To Judah, he said in verse 8, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be, it's all future tense. Your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be in the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall down, bow down before you. So it's all future tense. I'll just tell you in advance that Joseph is all past tense. Uh, Judah is a lion, is a young lion, lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. So here's how you've grown. And now you bow down and you lie down as a lion. So you have matured and as a lion, this is a mature lion, and as a lion who, who's going to rouse you now that you've found your place, right? You know, leave, let sleeping lions lie. The scepter, scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. So you'll rule. You'll be giving out the law until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be obedience of the people. So binding his donkey to the vine. So you, you're, you're going to have a donkey, which is a sign of wealth. You're going to have be so rich that you, instead of tying it to a tree, you're going to tie it to your grapevines because you're going to have so many. And the donkey's colt to the choice vine. You wash your garments in wine. That's because grapes, that was a big deal, right? You're going to wash your clothes in wine. That's how rich you will be. And it's clothes in the blood of grapes, and his eyes are even darker than eyes because you're just so drunk on all your riches. And his teeth whiter than milk. Okay, Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bowel. A fruitful bow by a well. So you're you're a vine that's planted by a well. It says, and the branches run over the wall. So it's you're so fruitful that look at you now. So he starts with, here's how you're doing now. It says the archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. So he's talking about his past. Now with Judah, he says, here's what's gonna happen to you, here's what's gonna happen to you, here can, because here's who you are, and this is what's gonna happen to you. With Joseph, he says, here's how you are, you're really rich. And here's what's happened to you in the past, which is not the same. I'm telling you, with all the other brothers, he's prophesying some future thing. With Joseph, he's, let's rehearse what's happened to you. The archers have bitterly grieved you, shot at you. They've hated you. Oh, good. Oh, hey, Bradley and Leslie and Susan and, and Pingo. Okay, I just want to make sure that, because uh, sometimes I feel like I'm talking to my wife and the computer and no one else. Okay, so you're a few, you, you, the archers have grieved you, they've shot at you, they've hated you, but your bow remained your strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the source of the Israel, you know, and Jacob, you know, from me, but I get my source is God. And by the God of your father who will help you. So this is how you're, you were made strong. You were made strong by the hand of the mighty God. Uh, verse 25, by the God of your father who will help you. And by the almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above. So talking about the past and how you were made strong. Though God blessed you. He preserved you. He's still not praying over his future. He's still not seeing his future. With all the other kids, he's just letting God speak through him. Here's what's going to happen to you. And some of them, bad news, right? But he didn't care. But Joseph, he's going to spend all of his time complimenting, complaining about what's happened in the past, and, and saying, here's how you were made strong by the hands of God, by the hand of your Father, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above and blessings of the deep that lie beneath. Now, here's what's interesting. He, now that he does get into, you're going to be blessed. He's very specific with the other people. But with Joseph, he just says, you're going to be blessed with all the blessings of heaven. All the blessings of the ocean. Blessings of the breast and the womb. You'll have plenty of kids. 
blessings of your father, that which have exceeded the blessings of my ancestors. So you're going to get all my blessings and my blessings. I've been blessed with 12 kids. My ancestors had like two. I've had 12. You're going to have so many kids. Uh, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph. All these blessings are going to be on your head. And that's it. I'm just saying how blessed you're going to be. Not that you can have a scepter and be a ruler or that you'll be a lawgiver. You'll just be blessed, 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 blessed. Joseph is just going to be blessed. Uh, and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his breath. And the, so blessings shall be on your head and on the crown of him that was separate from his brothers. Still kind of bitter about what happened. Okay. I feel like he's just making that up. I could have done that blessing over somebody. That's just me. You're going to be blessed, blessed, blessed. You're going to be blessed. But it's so non-specific. And I'm telling you, all the other ones, he says, you're going to live on ships. You're going to be in the mountains. Joseph, you're just going to be blessed. You're just going to be so blessed, 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 blessed. Then I think, was this from God or is this just from Jacob because he loves his son? Benjamin, very next verse. All he said, Benjamin is the ravenous wolf, and in the morning you shall devour the prey, and at night you shall divide the spoil. And that's it. Everyone, Judah got six verses, Joseph got six verses, Benjamin gets one verse. That's it. You're just, a, you're a rat. And it's the very next thing. You're going to be blessed, 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 blessed. You're going to be blessed. Benjamin, you're just a wolf. In the morning you devour the prey, but at night you'll divide the spoil. And done. So I, I want to talk about Joseph, Judah, and Benjamin and how their destinies were intertwined. God knew it in advance. And I'm doing this because God does things 100 years in advance. So he did things with your ancestors that were going to affect you today. He's doing things with you that can affect your children and your children's children or your nieces and nephews. He, he pl God plans so far ahead. Thank God goodness that's so great that he does that so we don't have to stress as much so okay uh just doing benjamin joseph and judah and how they're three of them are just intertwined all throughout history so in genesis chapter 35 verse 10 god changes jacob's name he uh he says and god said to him your name is jacob but your name shall not be called jacob anymore but israel so your name be called so he called his name Israel. So all of Jacob's kids, 11 of them, were not, they were born in Syria. He, he comes back with 11 kids and then God changes his name. After God changes his name to Israel, then a few verses later, that's when Benjamin is born. Benjamin is the only child that was actually born in the country of Israel from the man called Israel. All the rest of them came from this man called Jacob. God changed his name to Israel and he gives him this son. Very interesting. So it says, then they journeyed from Bethel, right after his name was changed. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem, Rachel labored in childbirth and she had a hard labor. So before she gets to Bethlehem, they are traveling from northern Israel down, it's called Canaan at the time, down to um, Jerusalem right, to Bethlehem, but God doesn't let Benjamin be born in Bethlehem, he's born right outside of Bethlehem, right outside of Bethlehem, in like northern Jerusalem, Judea, north, you know, north, uh, right outside of it, is where he's born, uh, so he, he um, now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also, and so it was as her soul was departing, or she died, so she dies in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin, that she called his name Ben-Onai, which means son of my sorrow, my pain, but his father called him Ben-Hamin, son of my right hand. So just like Israel just had his name changed, Benjamin has his name changed. He's given one name and then his name is changed. And Jacob was a Jacob at first and then he became an Israel. You know, he was the deceiver and the supplanter and the one who was scared that he was always going to be in second place. And finally, at the end of this life, he became the person who realized he was a prince with God and didn't have to try so hard all the time that God was fighting his battles. Benjamin was named, you're going to be the son of sorrow. And his father says, no, you're going to be the son of my right hand. And that's his life. That's not a mistake. 
Benjamin went through sorrows and then he became the right hand. Um, so it's interesting that Benjamin, he's born right before they got to Bethlehem, only child born in Israel. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Bethlehem, it says. Now, in Genesis chapter, uh, so we know that Judah is the one that sends Joseph to, to Egypt. His father sends him to Shechem to look for his brothers. They put him in the well. And Judah actually executes God's plan and says, let's not uh, let him die in this well. Let's sell him to these traders who will take him off to Egypt. He'll probably die there. But at least his blood will be in our hands. And Judah actually hears from God and initiates God's plan. Uh, Judah does that. Okay. But when they find out that, well, they don't know it's Joseph. When, they, when the brothers run into Joseph, um, and Joseph asks for Benjamin, bring me that little brother. So and here's the struggle for who does Benjamin belong to? Does Benjamin belong to Joseph or does Benjamin belong to Judah? So Joseph is disguised and they don't know he's the king and I mean Pharaoh's assistant and sin for my brother. So Benjamin is entrusted to Judah in Genesis 49, 9. He says, I myself will be surety for him. Judah says, I'll be surety for him. I'll put my life on the line for him. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back and set him before you, then let the blame fall on me forever. So I, I so the father says in verse uh, 13, I think, of Genesis 49, okay, take your brother and arise and go back to the man. So I'm trusting him to you, Judah. Joseph has different plans for Benjamin. When he gets there, he wants Benjamin to stay, right? Uh, so he tells his men in, in Genesis 44, in verse 2, put my cup, my silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, in Benjamin's sack, and his grain money. And so the servant does according to what the words of Joseph speaks, and, they, you know, he puts in him the sack because he wants Benjamin to stay. You belong to me. And that jo J J J Jacob said, no, you belong to Judah, which is why in verse 16, Judah says, what should we say to my Lord? Uh, what shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? Now that the cup is found in Benjamin's sack, but Judah saying, we're all guilty. We're all guilty for, for God has found out the iniquity of your servants. And here we are, we'll be my Lord's slaves, both we and him also with whom the cup was found. So I'm staying with him. Joseph doesn't like that. But Judah's like, no, I'm staying with Benjamin. He was entrusted to me, so we're all going to be your slaves, even though you found it in his sack. And Joseph doesn't like that. So Joseph says, uh, verse 17, but he said, well, far be it for me that I should do so. You don't all have to stay. The man in whose the cup was found, he'll be my slave. So just that one, I just need this one. This, Benjamin's going to stay with me. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. No harm, no foul. Just get out. But Judah says no. In verse uh, uh, 33. Uh, now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. Let him leave. I, I pro so they're fighting over Joseph's trying to trick them into letting Benjamin stay, and Joseph's pleading for Benjamin's life. Let him go so that now let me stay instead. And that's when Joseph finally, okay, I admit it, I, I can't win. And mentally he was, and, but it's still not settled. Because that's Joseph, Benjamin is Joseph's little brother. But Judah's the one who gave his life for him. So who does he belong to? Uh, now, when all the tribes finally are freed from Egypt, they go to the, and this we're just doing the history of Joseph. Judah and Benjamin, that little triangle. It's so interesting how God has these things worked out. Nothing happens by accident. Um, Benjamin being born where he's born, right in the northern part of Judea, uh, in between Shechem and Judah. Judah. Not an accident. Nothing's an accident with God. God just has this plan. Okay, at Numbers chapter fourteen, they're about to. They want to cross over the first time into the Promised Land. Caleb and Joshua go check it out. Joshua's from the tribe of Ephraim, which is Joseph's tribe. 
and Caleb is from the tribe of Judah. So these are the two leaders. They're kind of split, splitting, right? They go to different areas. Uh, it's not like they just hung out and they were buddies. All the 12 tribes spread out and God had already told them what land belonged to them. So they kind of went and checked out their land and then they all came back. Caleb went and checked out his land. Um, and then they said, nope, 10 of them said, nope, we can't go, but Judah and Joseph, Caleb and Joshua said, yeah, we can do this. And in Numbers 14, 24 says, my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he went. So he's gonna get the land that he went to. And he went south to Judea, what well, wasn't called that at the time, uh, and Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So he's gonna get, and his descendants will inherit it because he has a different spirit than you. So in Joshua chapter 14, says once they 40 years later once they finally are going into the land in Joshua 14 6 it says then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal and Caleb right so Joshua's from the tribe of Joseph or Ephraim his first, Joseph's second born child Caleb comes to him and says you know the word which the Lord said to Moses the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea you know that now therefore give me this mountain this is verse 12 of which the Lord spoke in that day. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. So uh, I want that mountain. So he'd gone to a mountain. He'd gone to Mount Moriah, where Jesus ultimately was crucified, where the temple was built. That's where he went. Give me that mountain. Joshua had gone to a different mountain. So give me that mountain. Uh, them out as the Lord said so he heads south uh, and Joshua 15 it says this so these cities are the limits so they, they gave it to him okay these cities are the limits of the tribe of the children of Judah so uh, toward the border of Edom in the south were Kabzil, Eder, Jagur they go mention this a lot I'm bringing up this particular verse because it's so interesting to me verse 25 Hazor, he's just mentioning, these are all the cities and towns that he was given. Uh, Hadath, Kerioth, Hezron. Okay, so Kerioth, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up Kerioth because a man from Kerioth, the, the word for man is Ish in the Bible. Adam's name, Ish, I-S-H. So if you're a man from Kerioth, you might be called Ish, Karyoth. From Dan. Um, so um, there's a very famous Ishkarioth. Ishkarioth, does that name sound familiar? Ishkarioth. 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 Judas Iscariot. To portray Jesus. And he's from the tribe of Judah. Judah and Jesus are from the same tribe. They're both from Judah. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and that's one of the towns. And Judas Iscariot, Iscariot. Uh, so Caleb goes and gets all these cities and he goes south. Joshua, on the other hand, who's from the tribe of Joseph, Ephraim Joseph, says, the bones of Joseph with the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem. So they took his bones, they held the, onto them for a couple hundred years, and they carried him back, and he's buried at Shechem. Shechem is between two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. This is where the blessings and the cursings were pronounced. So that's where Shechem is. That's where also where Joseph was kidnapped and thrown into a well, and his father gave him that land. So he gets, Joseph gets, two mountains, and Judah gets some mountains, uh, and she's like, ha, we both got mountains, okay, so, um, now, where'd Benjamin go, because that's, I'm, this is the connection between Benjamin and Judah, and who does Benjamin belong to, either Judah or Joseph, Benjamin is Joseph's little brother, but Judah's the one who saved Benjamin's life and offered his life for his, who's Benjamin going to feel the most loyalty to? In Joshua chapter 18, verse 11, 
It says, now the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin, because they're handing out lots. You get to go here, you get here. We do a parking lot. I got that lot over there. Same word, right? So here's where the lot of the, Benj of the tribe of the children of Benjamin is going to be. And it came up according to their families. And the territory of their lot came out right between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. <laughs> so Benjamin is literally at the very northern tip of Judah and the very southern tip of Ephraim, Joseph. So Ju Judah starts the south and you go down. Ephraim or Joseph starts the north and you go up from there. So you go up from there. And Benjamin is right in the middle because he could not choose who he's going to be loyal to. So there's this rivalry in that between Joseph and Judah, right? Or Ephraim and Judah. Uh, it says in Judges chapter 1, verse 1, Now after the death of Joshua, Joshua had been the leader for a little bit, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Because Joshua is no longer leading us. Which of these 12 tribes are you going to pick? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So I'm picking Judah above Ephraim, which is Joseph's descendants. Ephraim doesn't like that. I was the one who was king in, in Egypt and saved, rescued my brothers. Why are you letting Judah go first? Uh, in fact, in Judges chapter 1, and this happened a couple times, verse 1, it says, The men of Ephraim, Joseph's kids, gathered together and crossed over towards Zaphron and said to Jephthah, Jephthah had just led a battle against the Midianites. Why did you cross over to fight um, Ammonites? Why did you cross over to fight against the people of Ammon and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house down with you on, and, on fire. So, uh, it's like, we want you to call us. You call Ephraim if you get in trouble. You don't, and there's a rivalry for who's the baddest, right? Rivalry for who's Benjamin going to be loyal to, and a right is the rival for which of these tribes are you going to call on when you're in trouble? You can call on Judah, have them help you. You're going to call on Ephraim, because we're right from Joseph. And rivalry. Uh, Judges 20, verse 18. And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. And they said, which of us shall go up first to battle the children of Benjamin? Now, this is when Benjamin had gotten out of control. This is when Benjamin told you the story where uh, the man came to the tribe of Benjamin for help, but it was kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah there, and they raped his concubine, and then he chopped her up into 12 pieces and sent her all over uh, just to let everybody, look what happened. They raped her until she died, and that's the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin refused to repent. And so they said, well, we have to kill them all. Uh, so who will go up first? Who will go up first? Against the children of Benjamin, the Lord said, Judah first. So God keeps choosing Judah, but Joseph's like, hello, we're up here. We're the bigger tribe, so quit it. All right. The first king, now remember, Benjamin's the only one born in Israel. The other 11 sons were born in Syria. Benjamin's the only one who was born in the land of Canaan, which they called Israel. He was born right next to Bethlehem, right north of Bethlehem. They didn't quite get to Bethlehem when he was born. So when God chooses his first king, who does he, what tribe does he choose him from? So interesting. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 21, and Saul answered and said, what? Am I not a bit? Because Saul comes, I mean, Samuel comes and says, God's anointing you, you, Saul. It says, uh, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest tribes of Israel? Am my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why didn't you speak like this to me? Like, you're choosing Benjamin? Yeah, because you were the only one actually born in Israel. The tribe of Benjamin was the only son that was actually born in Israel. So you get to be the first king for that reason. Uh, but you don't quite make it to Bethlehem. Your mother didn't quite make it to Bethlehem. So you, it won't be permanent. But I'm giving you you first. That wasn't some coincidence that you were born and the only child born in Israel. So, yeah, you get to be the first king. And he says, well, we're the smallest. Because remember back then when we went crazy and all the other tribes attacked us? There's only like 600 of us left. And then and the guys, I don't care. You get to be the first king, Benjamin. So, uh, now... Next, that didn't last, but at least he got that first honor. The tribe of Benjamin got the honor. Ha! 
of being the first. David then gets anointed king. Uh, and there's a little division now between Judah and Benjamin because Saul, the first king, came from Benjamin and David's supplanting him with peace from Judah. So people are deciding whether or not they're going to support David or not. Uh, but they finally do. And then David has it out with his own son. And, and his son tries to get all these other tribes to fight against his dad, David. Uh, and then David finally wins that battle after he's been in hiding for a while. And he says, now the king went on to Gilgal and Tim Ham went on with him. This is 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 40. So the king's on his way back home. Then all the people of Judah escorted the king and also half the people of Israel. So you got Judah and the rest of Israel. Judah, the rest of Israel. Judah's supporting their king and, and half of the people from the rest of Israel are supporting him. They're still kind of waffling on their, are we gonna support David or not? He's kind of goofy. Maybe we should just use a new tribe. Who knows? It says, just then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away from, stolen you away and brought the king, his household and all David's men with him across the Jordan? Why is Judah the only one really supporting you? And yeah, some of these people, but you stole him away from us? Like, you're acting like, like Judah is, you know, all that. And it said, uh, so all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel. It says, because the king is a close relative of ours, duh, he's from Judah. Why then are you angry over this matter? Like, we should be around the king because he's related to us. It says, have we ever eaten at the king's expense, it's not like he's like throwing money at us. It's just that he's related to us. Or has he given us any gift? So, you know, there's no favoritism going on. Just he's from Judah. So that's why we're here with him. And, and, and then all the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, but we have 10 shares to in the king. Therefore, we also have more right to David than you. Like if anyone's going to be, because there's 10 of us versus Judah, and at that point it was Judah and Simeon. At that point it was Judah and Simeon. It wasn't Benjamin. Benjamin hadn't decided who they were going to be loyal with, right? So it was like ten of us, just two of you. So if anybody should be, and and Ephraim, Joseph, they represented the ten. We should be the one escorting the king, and we should get all the praise and the pomp, and you know it's very important that we be next to him. And again, this is Ephraim and Judah still fighting for who's the best. So why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Like we're the one that said, bring him back and put him back in power. Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Like, so they were more intent. Like, no, don't you. Like, we, he's related to us. So they're still fighting over supremacy. So who's Benjamin eventually going to go with? Because a rift is coming. A rift is going to come. Um, here's what Benjamin does at first. In 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba. And this is right after they're trying to decide who gets to escort the king back to his palace, Judah or the other tribes led by Joseph. So very next verse. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Betri, who's a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, so which way is he going to go? Judah or Joseph? You're going to support. We have no share in David. So we don't like Judah. Nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So they're still mad that their guy, Saul, who's a Benjamite, had been kicked out. So we not, we're not in it. So you're waiting for them to choose which side. We're not choosing any side, but we know we're not supporting David. So... Everybody just go back to your tent. Nobody support him is their solution. Every man to his tent, so Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Betri. But the men of Judah from the border as far as Jerusalem, they remained loyal to the king. So now that's our first real split provoked by Benjamin. Now here's when the kingdom starts to divide uh, in 1 Kings. So just a, just a rivalry. Um... Jo, uh, Jacob's blessing that didn't help. Jacob said specifically, Judah, you're going to have the scepter. You're going to be king. 
until Shiloh comes and blah, blah, blah. But to Joseph, he says, you're going to be blessed with all kind of blessings from heaven and beneath. Bless, 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 bless. So they could both kind of point to, but look what Jacob said about us. We're going to be blessed. And Judah would say, but we said, we're going to be the king. Yeah, but we're going to be blessed. So there's this fight. Who, who really gets to be number one? So in 1 Kings chapter 11, a prophet comes to Jeroboam. Jeroboam is the, the head guy of the north from the tribe of Ephraim. Rehoboam at that point is Solomon's kid. He's obviously in the tribe of Judah. So David had Solomon. Solomon had Rehoboam. And he's king right now. But he's a terrible king. He's from Judah, but he's a terrible king. And he just puts more taxes on people and makes their life even harder. So, and, and idolatrous. And he's not that great. He's, bless his heart. So, and grand, David was his grandfather. It didn't, it didn't matter. He's going to do his own thing. So God's like, I've got to teach Rehoboam a lesson. And, and the prophet comes to Jeroboam, who's from the tribe of Joseph, right up north. He says, take for yourself 10 pieces. So tear this cloth into 12 pieces. Take 10. You're going to get 10. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to you. So for a while, you'll be leading 10 tribes, but he shall leave one tribe. So you get 10, but I'm going to leave one tribe for Judah for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. So for the sake of David, for the sake of Jerusalem, for the sake of all that I have planned, I'm giving, leaving one tribe loyal to him. Who was that tribe? Oh, well, so Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam. This is a little while later. Rehoboam's given them an edict, a th a three, like, give me three days and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do about you. Jeroboam already knows this prophecy. He already knows what God's going to eventually do. But he doesn't say anything to anybody. So Jeroboam and all the people come to Rehoboam the third day as the king had directed. This is 1 King 12, 12, saying, come back to me the third day. Like, come back in three days, I'll give you an answer. Then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, so they came to him saying, could you give us a break on these taxes and all this stuff and hard labor? Give me three days to think about it. So when they come back, he says, okay, here's my answer, and you're not going to like it. He says, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges, which is whips like with stones and stuff on them. Like, I'm not going to just whip you. I'm going to take the flesh off your back. Why he thought they'd go, brava. Thank you. May I have another? Well, I don't know what he thought. Well, I'm from the tribe of Judah, and so that means, I, well, if you mess up, God will take your stuff away for a while. So uh, verse 15 says, so the king did not listen to the people for the turn of events was from the Lord. God had already said was going to happen, that he might fulfill his word, which he had spoken by Ahijah to Jeroboam. So Ahijah is the prophet that just came to Jeroboam in the last chapter. Uh, now, when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share we have we in David? We have no inheritance. Like, we're not going to, why are we hanging with you? To your tent, O Israel. Now see to your own house. And so they all left. Benjamin had started that sort of thing earlier with David. But now with Rehoboam, but at least David, everybody liked David. Rehoboam, nobody liked him. And he thought, Oh, they're going to just stay loyal to me no matter what I do. Because God has just decreed it. No, nope. God decreed loyalty to him him and when we mess up god will switch things up on us for a while till we learn our lesson so people god wants people loyal to him if you're okay anyway but benjamin shockingly chooses judah because that's the, again the benjamin's always do i go with joseph do i go with David, uh, judah do i go with joseph do i go with judah <sighs> benjamin's in the middle so in in first kings chapter 12 just a few verses later Verse 20, it says, and when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. Because remember, he says, I'm going to leave one with you. You can take 10 pieces, Jeroboam, and go north. But I'm leaving one with Judah. Who did it turn out to be? It turned out to be Benjamin. It says, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel. So Rehoboam said, okay, Benjamin, 
you and me against those 10 tribes. We're going to go for it. That he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah, and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You should not go up to fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. They're turning their back because I'm influencing them to do that. Uh, so sometimes we're in a slump, and Lord... We're praying, God, take it away and fix it. And God's like, no, I actually sent it. I said, because you need to learn a lesson. Because God is not interested. God's most interested in our character. He's interested in who we are on the inside. And he will do whatever it takes to shape us and change our hearts. It makes our hearts more supple to him, being obedient to him. Not just because he loves people to be obedient to him, but because he's designed the system. And when we are obedient Because God knows how it works. He's not just making stuff up. Uh, try number A and door uh, number B. He's, he knows what he's doing. So he wants us to be obedient to him because it's to, in order to save our lives. You know, it's like the person says, don't stick your hand in your fire. Oh, you just like telling me what to do. No, I'm telling you, don't stick your hand in the fire. Cause, oh, you're just trying to control me. Okay, go ahead. So he's, he's like, listen to me because it's going to save your life. And I will do whatever it takes to, to train you in how to be obedient to me. So if your finances have to take a dip for a while or your friends have to turn their back on you for a while or whatever it takes so that you you start, he'll give us a desert experience, you know, and send us to the desert or send us to the wilderness so, so that we start to trust in him more. That will ultimately save our lives. So this momentary dip sometimes sends us to our knees more. We have to pray more. Somebody's in the hospital, and now we're praying every day where we weren't praying every day before. But now every day, Lord, Lord, Lord. And now he's going to fix it. But sometimes something comes, and says, God, that's from me. So, yeah, they're all rebelling against you. Go back home because I sent that. Because I want you to be, why are they rebelling? I want you to start talking to me but when you make your decisions. Because you can listen to all these other people. You're not listening to me when you make your decisions. Read your bowl. So this is going to make you listen to me. So this split happens. Now the problem is God went to Joseph and said, now you've got to leave these people right, otherwise I'm going to take it from you too. And Joseph or Ephraim, they, uh, they, got, they went way worse than Rehoboam ever was. And people started following them. So God warns Joseph, uh, which again... I, you know, Jacob was partly right. You're going to be blessed, blessed, blessed. Yeah, for a little bit. But he didn't tell Joseph any bad news. He told everybody bad news except Joseph. Just good, 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 good. And sometimes you can have a blind spot to your own children or to your own whatever. And, and, and you've got to be in God's face so you're able to hear the truth from God about things. Otherwise, you just see the world the way you want to see it. And, oh, yes, God's going to bless you. And God never said that. And God's going to do that. God never told you that. But that's what you want the world to be. And that's what Jacob was doing. He's, I'm not listening to God. I've already decided how I want the world to be. And I'm just going to make God do it. Well, God's not going to do it. Won't he not do it? So in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah comes and prophesies to the northern people. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 8, he says, The Lord sent a word against Jacob. So interesting because he's been called Israel for so long. But now these 10 tribes, he's calling them Jacob. That's not a good thing because Jacob's the bad version of Israel. So the Lord sent a word against Jacob and it has fallen on Israel. So he's, he's sending a word against the bad side of Jacob, but it's affecting Israel. And at this point, they're calling it Judah and Israel. Judah and Israel, right? The south is called Judah, the top is called Israel. So Jacob's doing a bad thing and it's falling on Israel. So you're acting like Jacob. You're acting like the one who doesn't trust me, because Jacob never trusted God, and God had to change his name to Israel to try to teach him to trust him, because Jacob lied to Esau, and Jacob was like, I don't trust that God's going to do it, so I'm going to have to do it my way. Uh, so, the Lord's in a word against Jacob, but it's fallen in Israel. 
all the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria. So that's where Joseph settled in Samaria. Galilee is the very north, Samaria is the middle, and Judah is the bottom. So Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in their pride and arrogance of heart, huh, the bricks have fallen down, but will we rebuild and hew stones? The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. So he's saying in your pride and arrogance, instead of saying, I wonder why God let this happen. I wonder why the bricks have fallen down. Is there something that we should be doing differently? God always wants to ask those questions. Sometimes the bricks have fallen down in your life. It has, it's not something that you're doing. You didn't do anything wrong. But it's okay to ask. Sometimes the bricks have fallen down in your life because there's something God wants you to notice. And so, but you always want to go to him and say, okay, what's happening here? Is this something I'm doing wrong? Is this something, right? And sometimes he'll say, no, like, why was the man more blind? Did he sin? Or did his parent? God, Jesus said, no, neither. That has nothing to do with it. I'm letting, I let this happen for a whole other reason. But in this case, he says, the bricks have fallen down and we'll just rebuild them. We're not even going to ask why. We'll just build them up bigger with stone. He says the sycamores are cut down, but we'll get some cedars. So we'll build up bigger. So stuff started happening bad to Ephraim, the children of the descendants of Joseph. They didn't care. They never looked at it. They never said, I wonder why things are going wrong. They just said, that's going wrong, but we'll make it right. William, he says, Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. Like you, I'm going to bring you guys against each other. And you guys are the two sons of Joseph. And that whole area of Samaria is just going to get messed up. And together they shall be against Judah. So you guys can go against each other and not work. To, and then you're going to try to get Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. I, my anger is not turned away, but my hand is always stretched out to save you if you'll just turn. So God can start sending consequences our way, but his hand is still stretched out if we'll just go, okay, something's wrong. I'll repent. So his hand is always stretched out. It's not like, nope, sorry, I'm punishing you, and that's it. It's like, even in the middle of the punishment, even in the midst of consequences for things we've done, God's still like, but I'm a hand stretched out, so as soon as you repent, we can get on the road and go. So, Ephraim and all those northern tribes are taken captive. Judah still exists. Uh, and so in 2 Kings chapter